Welcome to Winchester Cafe Sci Online and a special welcome to those joining us for the first time. A recording of this talk will be posted on our YouTube channel where you'll find recordings of all our online talks. I'll put details in the chat. Please subscribe to our channel to help us reach a wider audience. It was interesting to note that our November talk um, has suddenly gone into the stratosphere. We normally get about 80 views on our recordings. Uh, last time I looked, that one was about 9,000 and going up by 1,000 a day. Um, if you enjoy tonight's talk and you're not on our mailing list, you can sign up for it there to be notified about future talks. It's looking hopeful that we'll be able to resume live events at our usual place and time from April. In the meantime, we're making the most of the opportunity to welcome speakers from further afield that can join us in person. And tonight's speaker is a biologist whose research has primarily focused on primate genetics, molecular ecology and conservation biology. Her current role as co-director of the Pan-African program, the Culture of uh, Chimpanzee, is focused on studying chimpanzee ecology and evolution from all four pan troglodytes subspecies from over 40 temporary research sites across Africa. Her doctoral and postdoctoral research focus on developing precise and accurate mesh methods of monitoring great apes. As most primates tend to live in low visibility environments, are cryptic and are generally sparsely distributed, it's been very difficult to obtain population estimates for almost all great ape subspecies. Her current research is on developing cheaper and more efficient means of using non-invasive samples for genetic amplification to use in biomonitoring activities and assess the potential of using conservation genomics from fecal samples to better understand the evolutionary trajectories of great apes. She's also been a great supporter of uh, pro my main project at Rebalance Earth. So from the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, please welcome Dr. Mimi Arendjelovic. Thanks, I'll share my screen now. That one. All right. So uh, thank you very much, William, for inviting me uh, to give this talk. I'm really excited to do the discussion part at the end. So um, yeah, please give me all your questions when I'm done. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my name is Mimi, and um, today I'm going to be talking about our Pan-African program, the Culture Chimpanzee, which we call the Pan-Af for short. Brief outline of my talk today, I'm going to give an introduction, uh, then talk about the Pan-Af specifically, then I'm going to try to focus on our video camera trap work, so the chimp behaviors we've been studying, our citizen science project called Chimpanzee, and then our um, AI for automated um, annotation of camera trap videos called Zamba Cloud. And then I'll talk a bit about chimpanzee genetics as William explained, that's sort of my main background. And then a little bit about future outlook for the PANAF. So we are currently in a biodiversity crisis. There's more than 7.9 billion people on the planet. I uh, looked at this up online today and how to update this slide because it's increased recently. Um, we are losing about 30,000 species per year. And the tropics contain about 50% of all described species. Africa in particular has 111 primate species, three of the four great ape species, and its deforestation rate is twice the world's average. So Africa really is a hot spot for biodiversity, but also it needs a lot of conservation action. And why do I focus on primates and great apes? Well, they're charismatic megafauna which means that people care about them. When they see chimps or gorillas or bonobos or orangutans or many monkey species, they feel something for them. And that allows us to use them as umbrella or flagship species, which means that we're not just caring about chimpanzee conservation. We use chimpanzees because if we protect them and their environments, we also protect all of the other species uh, that live in those environments. And that's what we call an umbrella species. They sort of umbrella all of this other biodiversity that we really care about protecting. They're also important keystone species. So they're big seed dispersers and they're very important for um, ecosystems to persevere and for plants to be able to spread themselves. And then from an anthropological perspective, they are our closest living sister taxa. So we can learn a lot about ourselves by studying great apes. 
Um, there are, however, alarming population declines in all of the great ape species. We are perpetually seeing um, topics like this, um, that we are losing them at a, at a very high rate. This is a 2012 study, so it's already 10 years old, and things have not really been improving for the great apes. And as William mentioned, my talk today is going to be focused on chimpanzee culture. And you might ask yourself, well, with all of this sort of conservation gloom and doom, why would we even care about chimpanzee culture? And it is becoming a hot topic. It's not just about preserving the genetic diversity of a species, but also its cultural diversity. We know in chimps that they have very different behaviors depending on which chimpanzee population you're looking at. And it's important for their ecology and their persistence that the unique um, repertoire of cultures that they have are preserved as well. So the Pan-African program, it had the goal, to, or it has the goal, to understand the ecological and evolutionary drivers of behavioral and cultural diversity in chimpanzees. And the problem is, is you may have heard about these almost now legendary long-term chimpanzee field research sites like Jane Goodall's Gombe or Christoph Bush's Thai. Um, and we have this amazing long-term life history data of chimpanzees, but we have very few of these sites. So when we want to understand the drivers of the diversity we see, we just don't have big enough sample sizes, just not enough sites to really stud study this and really differentiate between the different hypotheses we might come up with. So the solution of the PANAF, which was founded by Dr. Christoph Bush and Dr. Jan Markul, was a series of temporary research sites across the chimpanzee range. And this is what we call the PANAF. Now, although we were focused on chimpanzees, it also gives us all this information on biodiversity, um, biodiversity threats, and also to help us identify conservation opportunities. So I wanna talk a little bit more about this sort of issue of scale, precision, and time. So we can study things at the landscape level all the way to the individual level, but there's a trade-off with precision and time. So when we study things at the landscape level, we have very low precision, but it doesn't take a lot of time. This is a study here from Liberia, for example. It took about two years to collect the data, maybe another year to analyze it. And then we have um, a map of connectivity of chimpanzees. But we don't have any information on individual chimpanzees, which is the other end of the spectrum. This is the sort of information we get from long-term field research sites. However, to habituate a group of chimpanzees takes at least five years, and then it is a lifetime, if not in perpetuity, co commitment. Because once you've habituated chimpanzees, you can't ever really leave them because now they're not scared of humans, they're not scared of hunters, you have a responsibility towards them. So here you would have very amazing um, individual data on, in, on individuals throughout their lifetime, and you would have very high precision, but also a lot of time. Uh, it takes a lot of time to collect that data. So the PANF tried to sort of find the sweet spot between these two extremes. And this is what our series of temporary research sites look like. We ran them from 2010 to 2018. And the four different colors here represent the four different um, chimpanzee subspecies. Um, which are um, subdivided by some geographic barriers, mainly rivers. And um, all of the large circles, these are places where we had complete data sets. I'll explain what a complete data set is in a moment. And the small dots are areas where maybe we could only get camera traps or fecal samples um, or some other type of sample. We also did two nationwide surveys. One was of Liberia, another of Equatorial Guinea. And the X's are places where we went, but either we didn't find chimpanzees because they had already been locally extirpated, um, or they are areas that were maybe under some civil unrest so that we couldn't work there safely. So the PANAP starts with the PANAP data collection protocol. It was standardized across all the sites. It's freely available on our website in English and French, so anybody can use it and have the same methods that we used. Then volunteers would come to Leipzig at the Max Planck and they would do a two week training. So everybody was trained in the same way. We could talk in a group about troubleshooting, et cetera. And then they would spend 14 to 24 months at each field site. They were in the most rudimentary conditions you can imagine, tents for up to 24 months, very basic cooking. This was really, really hard work. I'm very, very protective of our field teams because they formed the entire basis of the Pan App and the work was really, really difficult. And then the teams were made up of about three to six people. So it would be one of our field managers, some, in some cases two, and then they would hold, um, hire a, local, a team of local assistants. This is Anthony Agbor and his team in Guinea. 
And then data collection would occur in a zone of about 11 to 143 square kilometers and is supposed to represent one chimpanzee territory. So our field site managers would go out and they would collect data on chimpanzee nests because chimpanzee make nests every single night, a different one. So you can sort of look at areas with high chimpanzee nesting rates and assume that this must be part of their territory. You can also look for feeding signs, um, knuckle marks, things like that. And then after sort of recording all of these chimpanzee signs, we would try to estimate what one chimpanzee territory was, and then all data collection would occur in this grid. And then after all the data was collected, they would come back to Leipzig for about one to three months of data wrap up. So what kind of data did we collect? Um, the first is we did line transects and habitat plots, and this is to look at habitat structure. So basically documenting the sorts of trees and plants that exist in the forest. They did phenology studies. This looks at seasonal fruit avail availability, so we knew what was present in the forest for chimpanzees to eat. This means that they identified 200 trees and then we monitor them once a month to look at how many leaves, flowers, and fruits were growing on those trees. And then we collected a lot of inorganic environmental data as well. Next, we looked at strip and line transects, and we um, made bee traps to find um, abundance of termite, ant, and bee species. This is because chimpanzees eat termites and ants. They often do it with tools, and they also eat honey, which they sometimes do with tools as well. Then we use camera traps a lot, <laughs> and we combine them with strip transects to look at tool use, chimpanzee tool use, and also the availability of tools. We also use camera traps, line transects, and carrion flies um, to survey biodiversity, look at chimp prey species. They eat lots of different monkey species, for example, chimpanzee predators like leopards, chimpanzee competitors like pigs that eat the same fruit on the ground as chimpanzees, and also look at human pressure. We also used camera traps in addition to fecal samples to look at chimpanzee social structure and demography. And then we use fecal samples for a lot of other stuff too. We can look at genetic population history and selection, pathogens that are affecting chimpanzee guts, as well as the microbiome. And we also use fecal samples just by looking at what seeds we can find in the feces, as well as genetic metabarcoding to look at diet and isotope analysis of chimpanzee hair collected from those nests I was telling you about, as well as isotope samples from sympatric flora and fauna. Oh, sorry. Um, Yes. Okay. And so then we can put all of these sources of data together in meta analyses, as well as doing independent studies on each of those topics. So in 2019, we published this paper, which was human impact erodes chimpanzee behavioral diversity. And what we found was here on the y axis, you have the um, predicted probability of occurrence of different behaviors. And on the x axis, you have human footprints. So this is a lower human footprint on the left and a higher fo human footprint or human impact is another way of thinking about it on the right. And you can see in all of the measures that we use all behaviors or just tool use behaviors, the more human presence, the lower the behavioral repertoire of chimpanzees. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about these levels of diversity that I, I mentioned in, in terms of our data collection. So the first layer is just GIS data. So this is the satellite data that we can um, you know, acquire about the different areas that we're interested in. Then we collected all this field data I told you about. And from there, we can extract genetic information. We can look at the ecology of the um, chimpanzee landscapes, the microbiome, look at the demography of the chimpanzees from the camera traps, as well as the various behaviors. So I'm gonna focus now a little bit on the interplay of ecology, demography, and behavior that we're getting from the camera traps. So the first thing is, is when you watch videos is that you can find some really cool species that you didn't expect. This is a caracal. And if you look at the distribution of caracals from the IUCN, which is sort of you know, the database where we know everything we know about endangered and other species, well, this caracal is, was found way outside of the range of caracals. So this was very exciting and it's something that we reported to the IUCN to increase the range and so that we know that perhaps there needs to be conservation action for this species in this area. Similarly, we found a lion on a camera trap in Gabon. And if you look at the distribution of lions, it also is quite outside the range. And this prompted a lot of conservation action in Gabon for um, lions so that the lions will return to the country if they're a source of national pride. And so it's been really exciting to see a rewilding project um, really developing in this area of Bateke and Gabon. 
We also were able to record in the literature the, um, for the first time this chimpanzee accumulative stone throwing behavior. So you can see here the chimps are grabbing large rocks and then as part of their display, the rocks are going into the tree hollows. Um, they also do this against buttresses and then you get these accumulations of stones. And we're not entirely sure why they're doing it, but we have researchers that are continuing to try to solve that mystery. We also um, identified this um, behavior of uh, algae fishing. So algae fishing had been recorded before for sur surface algae with very short tools at a few sites um, and done very occasionally. But here in Bakun, uh, the chimpanzees are trying to get the algae that's at the bottom of the riverbed with these very long tools and they do it for hours on end during the dry season. Um, this was found by Anthony Agbar, who I showed you earlier. Um, and his amazing <laughs> placement of camera traps at the field sites that he managed. And then also, even when you have a habituated chimpanzee community, you rarely study them at night. Usually they go to bed and you go to bed. But from our camera traps, we were able to study the nocturnal activities in wild chimpanzees and looked at what that um, correlated to and if it occurred at all the sites. And then, um, a recent study that we also did was looking at chimpan chimpanzee ethnography. And we found that if you look at one particular behavior, in this case, termite fishing, the different groups were doing the behavior in very group specific ways. So I'll just show you some examples here from this compilation. Here we go. All right, so starting here, this is a chimpanzee from Guologo Triangle in Congo. First, they use a tool to perforate the underground termite mound. And then you can see that this chimp has another tool in its mouth, and they're gonna use that tool to do the fishing. So you can see the chimpanzee is standing here, then sits down. We'll replace the perforating tool with the brush tip tool, smells the perforating tool to make sure that they're inside the termite mound. Using um, its teeth to make more of a brush tip than inserting it and then bringing it to its, through one hand and bringing it to its mouth. But at this other site, for example, in Korup, Cameroon, the chimpanzee is lying down and almost always using the elbow to, to guide, it seems almost the fishing um, tool. So they have this behavior where um, the tool has to pass through the arm first and then this female is eating the, uh, the termites off that tool which is different from what we just saw. She's also sort of reclined um, while doing this behavior. And this is a third site from Wonga Wonga in Gabon. And here you can see multiple chimps and they're all lying down while doing their termite fishing. It's a little bit of a modification of this elbow technique that we saw in the previous site, but um, they're all lying down here when they do this. And so um, what Christoph Bush uh, developed here was a chimpanzee ethogram. So what behaviors occur when the chimps arrive at the nest, when they do the perforation task, what's their body position, how they modify their tool, and then um, depending on their hand technique. So do the termites pass through the hand or go directly to the mouth? And when you build up this ethogram, you see that almost each of the sites have their own unique way of fishing for termites. And similarly here again are those different behaviors that are mentioned and the different sites here along the bottom. And you can see, see for example, at Guologo, they almost, um, they almost all sit while they're, term or they all sit while they termite fish, but you never see them using a long brush, for example, which is different at another site like Korup where they always do a lip shake um, and they uh, never use a side wrist. So um, why this is important or interesting for us is, there's a debate if animal culture is just independently invented by every chimp on its own, or if they're learning from each other. And sort of this evidence for conformity moves towards the hypothesis that the chimps are learning from each other and that they all do it in the same way for a reason. Now we have another issue at hand is that from all of these Pan-African sites, um, we've collected 600,000 one minute long videos. And we can do these nice studies on chimps or maybe you know, pick up a few anecdotes of animals that are in the areas where they're not supposed to be, but how do we really watch 600,000 one minute long videos? And to do this, we turn to citizen science. 
So this is our platform called Chimp and C, which is available at chimpnc.org. And um, anybody can use that platform. You just have to log in and then you can get to helping us annotate our camera trap videos. Uh, when you what, come to the site, you'll see that there's some different workflows here. Um, each of the sites gets a code name. So there's a site here called Zenon Bloom, another one called New Dragonfly. And then there's various workflows. For example, this one allows you to annotate very general categories, um, which we call species ID workflow. And then we have more specific ones. For example, if uh, in the species ID workflow, you would just annotate monkey. And in the monkey C workflow, you could annotate what species of monkey if you feel confident with your monkey species identification skills. So this is what it looks like when you start a video. You have a video that plays. <clears throat> and then there are these 24 categories that you can choose from uh, for what you think are, is in the video. In this case, I would guess that this is, or I would say this is some type of hog. When you click on hog, it brings you some information about hogs. Various pictures can be clicked on so you can compare it to your video. Um, it tells you that it's often confused with antelope or diker. So you could click there and see um, the, the same sort of setup for antelope diker to make your decision. And then it asks you some questions. So how many do you see? I see more than five. They're on the ground. What are their behaviors? They look like they're foraging when I watch the video. And the video is in black and white. And then I click identify. And I've done a classification. And um, these videos are shown to multiple people. Uh, so up to nine people with varying retirement rules. So if the first four people watch this video and they all agree that there were hogs in the video, then the video would be retired out of circulation. If there was disagreement, maybe some said antelope, some said hog, then it would be showed up to, uh, shown up to nine people. And then we would take sort of a majority rules on what this video contains based on those results. And as I mentioned, there's these additional species level identifications in the monkey C and trotters ID workflows. Um, and we can also um, hashtag the results sort of like on Twitter, where you can um, go here done and talk rather than just done, it will bring you to our chat board and then you can put the hashtag hog or hashtag river hog on this video. What we also do on chimpanzee is chimpanzee matching. So this is done through our chat board. We have a very vibrant community that can um, that contributes to these chimpanzee matching discussions. And basically, they watch two videos and they say, oh, I think I've seen this chimp before. Let's compare them and talk about them. They make these beautiful collages. So on this side here, this is from chimp from one video. On this side here is a chimp from another video. And they point out there's a little white mark beside the nose in both of these individuals. There's another white mark under the eye. They have similar head shapes, shoulder tufts. And at the beginning, maybe all chimps look the same to you. But once you get into the discussions, you start to see that you know, every chimp is unique, just like every person is unique. Um, we tried to look at uh, um, the, this ability of citizen scientists to, um, to identify chimpanzees and how they compare to expert chimpanzee identifiers. So we started with 305, uh, sorry, one moment. We started with 305 chimpanzee videos and we showed them to experts. Experts identified 907 chimps in these videos, which represented 36 individuals. So of course, in the 305 chimp videos, you can have multiple individuals, that was the 907, and the same chimps show up in multiple videos, so that's the 36 individuals. The citizen scientist identified 474 chimps from these same videos, which represented 29 individuals. So they, of course, they identified fewer chimps, um, but when we compared them, the chimps that they did identify had 99% agreement. So they almost perfectly agreed. Now, what's important to note here is that the experts were, um, these were habituated chimpanzees and the experts had knew them in person. They had seen them live. And this is a much easier task when you've seen chimpanzees in real life or those specific chimpanzees in real life. And then you have to identify them on video. It would be the same with people. Um, and so when we look at, okay, we have this reduced data set, although it's very accurate, it's reduced, how would that affect something like the social networks that we can construct from these videos? And what we found was that the experts and the citizen scientist um, results are, all, are very, very comparable. Of course, the citizen scientists have so fewer connections in their social networks, but the main clusters of individuals remain the same um, and they remain consistent between the two data sets. 
Now, <laughs> we've been doing our citizen science project for about five years and we're only about halfway through the videos. So although it's highly accurate, really effective, and it's a great conservation outreach tool, we do wanna sort of improve the speed at which we can annotate videos. And the team at Driven Data approached us to launch a competition that was generously funded by the Arcus Foundation. And the goal of this um, competition was to uh, reach out to the machine learning or AI community and have them develop um, an AI or an algorithm that could automatically identify species in camera trap videos. And this resulted in Project Zamba, which is uh, online open source software available on GitHub which has the original Zamba algorithm um, for automated species um, detection from camera trap videos. The problem is, is you sort of need to do no programming and have that skill set in order to run it, which made us realize what we really needed was a user-friendly interface that any conservation practitioner or scientist could use. And that led us to the development of Zamba Cloud, which is available now at zambacloud.com. And we've been making more and more improvements to it. So we're currently on version 2.0. So this most recent, recent version of Zamba Cloud, um, what we wanted to do was really try to give it as many videos as possible to train it to identify as many species as possible in species groups. So we gave it videos from 28 locations in 14 countries. Um, it was about 170,000 videos. Um, it was given to train, oh, train and test on. And we gave it 32 output classes. So some are very broad like bird and some are very specific like cheetah. Um, and what's important to know here is that we try to make this as uh, the, the testing of this as realistic as possible. And so the videos that we trained it on tended to be from different ca cameras than the videos we tested it on. Because if you train it on videos that you then eventually test on, you create a bias towards your camera locations. So really what we want to show here is if you give it brand new videos, how well will Zamba perform on your data? And these are the sorts of results we're getting. Um, machine learning people, they have their ways of light of um, outputting the results that I always have to sort of remind myself about, about precision and recall. So precision is when Zamba calls something a hyena, how often is it actually a hyena? So it ignores any time that it misses a hyena. And recall is when something actually is a hyena, how often does Zamba call it a hyena? So it ignores all the times um, that he, hyenas weren't counted at all. And F1 score is sort of the balance. Now, if we had humans annotating these videos, the numbers would be sort of closer to 95, 98%. So these aren't necessarily numbers for all the categories that we're fully confident in, but confident with but it's moving in the, in the right direction. We've made big gains over our original Zamba algorithm. And one thing that we know is when you train it on your specific camera locations, it does a lot better. So that's something we're really working on quantifying now. And just to walk you a little bit through what Zamba Cloud looks like, um, you upload your videos either by direct out, upload or by FTP. And then um, it asks you what model you wanna run uh, your, your annotation, um, algorithm on. And once you've uploaded your videos, you can easily run different models on it, which is great. You don't have to re-upload your data or anything. You can you get this really nice user output for your results. So you get um, a little snapshot of your video, which you can play, as well as the probability um, of what is in that video um, for all 32 different categories. And if you notice that there's a mistake, you can submit a correction that helps with future algorithm improvements. And this is perhaps the most um, exciting part is that you can retrain the algorithm based on your camera locations because, or on the species that interest you. For example, if you're really interested in a specific bird species, you can give uh, Zamba Cloud a new training data set with your type of bird of interest label it will retrain and then it will output the results um, based on other videos. So, oh, and sorry, and this is also important um, for your camera locations because you can train on your camera locations as well, which we also know will improve the results of Zamba Cloud. The other thing that we're right now working on, in, um, including in Zamba Cloud, is distance estimation. So, distance estimation is a powerful tool for estimating animal abundance, and it's based on the distance from um, the, the distance the animal is from the camera, as well as its detectability. 
It does not require individual identification. Um, which means that you can do it for a lot of species that doesn't that don't necessarily have sorry that don't necessarily have like really clear identifying marks. Um, it can be done for many terrestrial species. So these are two studies that recently came out. This one studied these four, uh, created abundance estimates for these four species, for, and one from DRC on these fourteen species. The problem is it's very time consuming. You have to watch the video. And you have to estimate the distance the animal is from the video about every two seconds or some other interval. So it takes a lot of time to hand annotate. So we are working on developing um, an automated method. This one was uh, supported by MathWorks um, for determining distance of animals from the camera traps, again, with driven data through competition. That competition just closed in December. And um, it looks like, <laughs> These are really amazing results that the accuracy is about 1.6 meters um, off from the true um, distance from the camera, which is this very good accuracy. So we're excited to incorporate this more into Zamba Cloud in the coming months and years. All right, so switching gears a bit, I'm going to talk more about the genetics and ecology part. So <laughs> genetic monitoring using fecal samples. Um, we use, for example, chimpanzee fecal samples. It's species specific. From them, we can get individual identity and therefore calculate or uh, yeah, calculate minimum number of individuals in an area. Um, individual identity is obtained through what you might have heard um, referred to as a DNA fingerprint. Uh, we can track individuals through space and time this year. If a chimp um, deposits a fecal sample in one place and then some kilometers away, we know that it's moving in that sort of area. Uh, it allow, it's um, conducive to opportunistic sampling. So if you're doing other biomonitoring activities in an area, you can just collect chimpanzee fecal samples. And we can also find out population history, connectivity of populations, as well as diversity of populations um, through the, gen uh, the, or the genetic diversity of the, of the population and how it's connected to other populations. And currently, the most cost-effective way for determining um, the genetic composition of chimpanzees or other species is amplification of microsatellite markers. Um, this is really sort of the old school way that we did forensics, um, not to get into too many details, but they're just short little parts of the DNA that are um, highly variable. And so every individual is unique for their combination of these microsatellite markers. But you probably have heard about sequencing technologies <laughs> Um, they're, they're getting cheaper and cheaper every year, and they provide a lot more information than these microsatellites. So we've been involved in some of this and some of the work to make sequencing technology more cost effective so that we can use it on fecal samples. So what I want to talk about specifically today with the genetics is um, the orphan ape trade and how genetics can contribute to it. It's estimated that the illegal pet trade has caused a death of more than 22,000 wild apes in between 2005 and 2011, and more than the majority of these are chimpanzees. Chimpanzees, um, they do better than let's say gorillas who are like very fragile um, in the pet trade. And um, in general, it seems that there's more chimpanzees in the pet trade than other great apes. And how they usually end up in the pet trade is that if hunters are hunting for bushmeat or other reasons, um, they'll kill the mother and they will take the orphan chimpanzee and then try to sell it. Sometimes also they specifically go out just to find, um, to find the baby chimpanzees to sell. So our goal is to determine the geographic location of origin of a sample based on its genotype. You can sort of think of this like 23andMe for orphan apes. Um, in 23andMe for humans, if you've ever seen this, it will tell you a lot about your sort of genetic history because humans can move a lot. Chimps don't move around so much. So the idea is really to zoom in on where this chimp has come from. And once we've done that, then the goal would be to repatriate these um, orphans to sanctuaries in their original country. And also if we find a lot of orphans coming from a particular area, then we can try to direct poaching, uh, sorry, law enforcement towards those um, areas and reduce the amount of poaching that occurs there. So, sorry, the slides are running ahead of me. <laughs> um, so how we approach this um, geolocalization uh, of orphans is this was work done by my PhD student, Jack Lester. 
And we had all of these fecal samples that came from the PANAF across the entire chimpanzee range. So 18 countries, 5,397 fecal samples. This was, again, a really, really huge job done by Jack Lester. He extracted them and genotyped them all at microsatellites, and they represented 939 distinctive genotypes. And why you might ask about this reduction is because about half of the fecal samples failed to amplify any DNA. And, um, and then, of course, you collect sometimes the same fecal sample from multiple um, sorry, you could collect the same individual from multiple different fecal samples. So you are amplifying the same individual over and over. And when you reduce it to unique individuals, there were 939. We have a overrepresentation of Western chimpanzees, virus chimpanzees here. Um, and we have not so many sampling locations from the Eliotai chimpanzees. And then Jack used um, geolocalization using the origin package. Now there's two ways that you can look at how well geolocalization works. The first is called with a reference population. So for example, here in this yellow circle is Thai forest. And with a reference population means you keep all of the samples in your database, in your genetic database. And then you take out one sample from the, from the Thai forest. And then you ask this package origin to try to tell you, and you put it back in to test it and you try to find out where did this sample come from. And when we do that with the reference population, on average, it does quite well. It's pretty close. Um, the assignment error is fairly close to the original population, but there is a lot of variation. It can easily be 500, 1,000 kilometers away. And this varies from subspecies to subspecies. So here, virus chimpanzees, these are the Western chimpanzees here, they have um, the lowest genetic diversity. When the population is expanded into the West, they went through what's called a bottleneck. So not that many individuals are moving into this area. And there's a lot of migration we found um, in this area. So it's not easy for the program to say, with this genotype, the individual comes from here. Now, the other way to do it is no reference population. That means you take out all Thai samples, for example, from the database. And then again, you just try to put one Thai sample and find out where it comes from. And not surprisingly, without the reference population, the program has an even harder time of telling you where a chimpanzee comes from. So again, on average, this is about 300, 400, 500 kilometers away with a huge variation. Um, for scale, this is 5,000 kilometers of error possible. And this distance here is 500 kilometers across Africa. So it's not really informative. And this is different um, depending, again, on the subspecies that you're looking at. So what does this tell us? It tells us certainly that more sampling is needed. And when Jack looked at um, the number of reference genotypes that are needed in the database compared to the assignment error, pretty much at 10 reference genotypes, you start to see a big improvement in your assignment error. So our recommendation is trying to identify 10 individuals per site if you're collecting chimpanzees from a new, uh, chimpanzee feces from a new site, um, which represents about 30 samples. This accounts for sample failure, as well as sampling the same individual multiple times. Now, um, in collaboration with Thomas Marquez Bonet in Spain and Aida Andres at UCL, um, we also were able to amplify the whole chromosome 21 from about 800 chimpanzee fecal samples, and then using a method called um, geolocalization with rare alleles. And this has a significant improvement on the results. Now, the downside, of course, is the sequencing of the chrom whole chromosome 21 is expensive. Um, but the results are impressive. So for the purposes of this talk, what's important here is this last bar. These are results, again, when you have the reference population present uh, in the database. But you can see that on average, about 75 kilometers um, is the assignment error you have using the sequencing. Here, this is broken down by subspecies. So Western chimpanzees are the same as virus chimpanzees. And you want to look here at the, oops, sorry, at the leftmost bar in each of these colored cases. So here, virus in purple, and this is also virus in blue. The um, average error is under 150 kilometers. Here, the average error is <laughs> spread quite a bit differently. Um, so the sequencing technology really improves our um, assignment ability. And this now is when you, uh, with the no reference in the database, this is looking at the 95% confidence interval. It means 95% of the data falls in here. Um, now, without a reference database, 
uh, the reference the reference population in the database your assignment area is around 540 kilometers when compared to the microsatellite data with no reference population it's significantly more in the thousands so really the sequencing um, method is allowing us to get much closer to our geolocalization dreams than the microsatellites so a little bit about a future outlook of our work we're going to continue the genetics we've already amplified the exome from all of our chimpanzee samples the exome is the coding region of the genome so all of the um, all of the genes that code for proteins for example and we want to look if we can find some population differences or if anything any genes have been selected for uh, in chimpanzee population history and we also really want to look at the interplay of genetics and culture uh, this paper that came out in 2010 said we could not disentangle uh, genetics and culture of chimpanzees because the populations we had again we have these very few long-term research sites and they were either very, very far apart geographically and genetically, or very, very close together. And so we couldn't tease apart um, the cultural and genetic differences that are dissimilarities that we see. But now with this larger data set, we truly hope to be able to do that. We also wanna look more into the chimpanzee ecological niche. For example, we found uh, recently that environmental variability supports chimpanzee behavioral diversity. So in the areas that are more seasonal, for example, the drier areas, they those chimpanzees, there's a trend that they have more behavioral diversity. And we really want to investigate this more using a lot of our habitat data, understand what is the chimpanzee ecological niche? How far can they be distributed? What might the effect of climate change be on chimpanzee populations? And then finally, I want to continue to work on conservation monitoring using all of this cool AI tech that we're developing from camera traps as well as improving on the work we're doing with fecal samples um, and identifying individuals that way. So with that, I want to thank the amazing PanAf Consortium, all the people that have contributed, and of course, the founders, Jan Markul and Christoph Busch, um, our collaborators on all these different projects I've talked about, our funding bodies, um, the amazing field site collaborators that have allowed us to work at their sites, and of course, the countries that allow us to do research um, in their countries. And I want to thank you for your attention. And I hope to see you at chimpanzee.org. Uh, my username is Mimi A. Just uh, tell me that you came from this talk, and um, I'd be really happy to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. I, I will just highlight for the um, benefit of the audience that um, I assume what you mean when you hope to see them at chimpanzee is you hope to see them as volunteers not subjects <laughs> exactly cool. okay um we'll get on let's get some questions into the chat uh, we're going to go straight into that um but before that a quick heads up on our next talk which is on monday the 7th of march um and it's on research into battery storage technology uh, by professor peter slater from the university of birmingham possibly one of our last uh, more distant uh, speakers for the uh, if we do manage to get back to live events fairly soon much as we would lo have loved uh, Mimi to come to Winchester I think there might be some childcare issues and other other complications <laughs> around that um so I'll wade in with a few questions myself because that's my privilege while we're getting people to um, chip in their own um so you were talking about the the difference between um habituated groups and non-habituated groups and trying to maintain a sort of balance in between are there um do you still have um or sustain support many um habituated groups sort of in posterity across africa where, where which countries are they most involved in um i mean us personally no but our collaborators that i mentioned at the end yeah there's several long-term field sites that ex that exist i mean basically once you've habituated a, a chimpanzee group it's a it's beyond a lifelong commitment because you can't ever really walk away from them you just leave them susceptible to poaching nor do i think you would want to i mean it's such a wealth of information but in uganda there i mean there's a, um groups that are habituated for tourism and groups that are um, habituated for research and some do double duty um uganda has uh, several um for tourism and research 
in um, Tanzania, there's several sites. So East Africa has quite a few sites. There's the Thai Chimpanzee Project in Cote d'Ivoire in um, Republic of Congo is the Gologo Project. Nigeria has a Gashaka Project. Senegal has the Fungoli Project. So there's quite a few. I think that right now it's like 12 sites are long-term, meaning that the chimpanzees are habituated, but maybe they've only been habituated for some years in that case. Okay, interesting. And I see we've just detected another species in the video and uh, the edge of the field. Your dog's just settled down in the corner behind you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so we had a question come in from um, Christine and David saying, are the different cultural populations discreet or do they mix at all? And thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, they, so pretty much whenever we study a new chimpanzee group, we find um, a unique set of behaviors in that group. Now that can um, be, uh, how can I say it? So we have, let's say neighboring chimpanzee groups in the Thai chimpanzee project. They all nut crack, but they nut crack in different ways. So some of them use stone hammers, some of them use stone anvils, some use wooden hammers or wooden anvils and combinations of those things. So to us, we recognize that they have different cultures and there are anecdotes. So in chimpanzees, only the females move between groups. Males stay in their natal community and it's the chimpanzees, that, uh, females that transfer between groups. And we have an anecdote at least that um, when chimpanzee females move into a group, they adopt, adopt the culture of that group they've moved into. So whatever they were doing in their previous group, they don't seem to do anymore. So if they had been using um, stone hammers, once they move into a group that uses wooden hammers, that's what they're gonna start using. For example, um, when we talk about more uh, diverse behaviors, let's say the algae fishing, we've only studied um, two or three groups now with camera traps that do the algae fishing behavior. And Anthony Agbor, who I mentioned before, our amazing um, algae discoverer, he basically walked down the river system and was collecting um, areas where he could find those algae tools. And at some point, he stopped finding algae tools. So we're, it seems unlikely that the chimpanzees don't move between those areas. We couldn't find any natural barrier, but the behavior, that cultural behavior seemed to stop. Mm. It's interesting that it seems to be a paternally transmitted pattern rather than maternally as well. If if the if the females pick up the the habits of the the male led group that they join, I think it's more a topic of conformity that you conform to the group that you're in. When we watch who's better at let's say nut cracking, it tends to be the females. Daughters are learning from their mom, and they have a bit more attention than maybe the sons. So it's sort of maternally inherited and then um, cultural uh, conforming to the group. Okay, interesting. I'm hoping we're going to get some genomics questions from Andrew, but he's obviously busy eating his dinner at the moment, so we'll give him a break for. <laughs> he's done several um, talks around those kind of subjects for us before now. So. In what ways would you say chimpanzee culture appears to resemble human and in what ways would you say it differs? Oh, that is a, a tough question. Um, I mean, I think that the conformity issue is I think that we see conformity in humans, you know, in, in a similar way. Um, I mean, this stone throwing behavior, of course, when it came out, people were really asking why are they doing it? Most of the behaviors that we see that are cultural um, really are about feeding a, a better way to get this algae from the water or uh, able to get to a nut that you crack. And with the um, stone throwing, you know, there was a lot of speculation in the media. Is it a, is it a ritual? You know, is it, is it the beginning of religion, which, okay, we don't, we don't conform to that idea, but you know, it starts to you know, we start to look at chimpanzees and wonder, do they have these like abstract thoughts? And we can see that some chimpanzees do rain dances. So when it thunders, they make displays at that thunder, which seems to be like the beginnings of origins of some of the symbolic behaviors that we do as well, which I just, I don't necessarily think that they have a religion or, or deep symbolism that way, but we see sort of the underlying pin, underpinnings of some of the things that make our own culture so interesting. When I've seen those um, stone throw videos, the thought that always comes to me is it's kind of like playing darts 
It's not, it's maybe, fun. Maybe, well, I mean, maybe it's not sort of ritual or anything like that. It's maybe that's chimpanzee sport. Maybe. No, exactly. We don't know what it's for. Maybe that, that's exactly maybe what it's for. Who knows? Uh, We're still trying to figure it out. Cool. I'm looking for some more questions from the audience. People like Don and Robin and Bob are usually filling oh, up um, that by you, now. Just, you just suggested, William, that it could be chimpanzee sport. Um, and uh, if we see sport as a recreational pastime, uh, with, um, then the rest of our time is looking for things which improve our survival. In other words, essence, things that are essential and better than we did yesterday. Um, do you see the, those sort of um, divisions in the uh, chimpanzee cultures? And do they learn from one another? In other words, if, they, if those down the next valley are getting big and fat because they're managing to fish the termites more successfully, would the ones on this side of the valley um, recognize that somebody has a better method and, adopt, and try it? I mean, that is a really great question, and I don't have a really great answer for it, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I mean, they've done captive studies where they show that there's a sort of conformity. So where there could be multiple ways to get at an answer and the chimps tend to conform to, you know, whoever modeled the behavior, the rest of them will sort of do it as whoever modeled the behavior. Um, intergroup interactions are a really, really tricky one in chimps. You know, they are very territorial. They do these incursions into each other's territory. They attack each other. They kill each other. Um, I don't know how much they can learn from each other in that sense. When they hear or see each other, they get very, very aggressive. Um, what we do see, though, sometimes, but it, very anecdotally, is when females come into the group, maybe they are bringing from their old group something that the new group didn't know how to do. Um, so like maybe hunting some sort of prey or targeting, maybe hunting is not the right word, targeting some sort of prey that the group, that when you know the group that was observed had never been observed eating that thing before. We're never sure if that's just like observer bias, like we just didn't know we're habituated chimpanzees long enough. Maybe they were eating that thing and it just seems novel that this female came in and now the rest of them are eating that. So, you know, there's still like a lot of mysteries in, in that sort of realm that um, we have with the, we're waiting for answers. Thanks. Andrew, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Oh, I um, prove that I have stopped eating my dinner. <laughs> it's all in the spirit of cafe side because you should be eating when you're watching. Yeah. Um, yep, uh, fantastic talk. We terrific, terrific range of uh, evidence there. But my specific question was: I interested that you're collecting fecal samples. So does that give you um, a picture of the um, gut fauna and flora of the chimpanzee communities? And does that have any significance in their behaviour or their state of health? Yeah, so we had a microbiome study come out last year um, and we found so much um, overlap between the groups. We found almost like a perfect correlation with geography and, and because geography correlates so well with genetics, it was really, really hard to disentangle these things. We tried looking at, um, you know, if chimps that were accessing resources with specific tools um, might have a different microbiome. Like we were kind of hopeful that the algae fishing chimps maybe had something mm -hmm. cool that they were getting from the water, but nothing was really like standing out that we could, you know, concretely say um, this, them consuming this sort of resource is leading to microbiome changes. But that's, I mean, that's also quite a limitation of our methods because almost all of our chimpanzees are unhabituated. All we can record on the camera traps our behaviors that they do in front of the camera traps. So it might just be that we don't have the right factors to correlate to any sort of differences that we see. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Perhaps they were throwing stones at the cameras. <laughs> now that's the elephants. That's the elephants, exactly. <laughs> elephants trash cameras. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay. And uh, just a reminder, people watching on YouTube, you can put questions into the chat there as well. Um, Becky, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, hi, um, Mimi. Thank you for such a great talk. It's really interesting. Um, I've been well out of this sort of 
area of knowledge for I suppose a few years now um but I did used to work um with Alex, Alex Pilla and Tanzania um on the Great Mahale ecosystem project and one of the things we looked at actually was looking at populations between known ranges so it was kind of I suppose a bit random but we looked at um kind of visiting those sort of areas where you wouldn't really expect to find any chimpanzees and trying to look at the corridors where you know perhaps they might be passing through or you know also sort of working with sort of communities to try and sort of obtain local knowledge and sort of, sort of anecdotal evidence as well so sort of wondered whether you were looking sort of more within like focusing efforts more than known ranges or whether actually sort of like um like branching out a bit as well and trying to sort of look into those more perhaps those sort of areas where you think they could be using them or perhaps you just don't really know and also sort of how the human side comes into it and how perhaps there is that interlink with the social anthropology side and um whether you have any connections with people working on perhaps the side of like folklore and and how that kind of comes into the conservation side with, with chimpanzees that's a lot becky okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right let me if i miss an answer just repeat it so um, in terms of working with local communities, that's how we got like a lot of the hints of where to place cameras or what sort of behaviors um, to look for, like the stone throwing behavior. We had a lot of people in the area saying, you know, we hear the chimpanzees throwing stones at trees, you know, and that was sort of like our, our very first hints. Um, and, you know, all of our field teams, except for the field manager, are local guys. So, you know, we always, that was like a big part of the project for helping us um, determine, you know, some of the, the neat things that we we saw. In terms of um, ranging, I mean, like I said, we we biased our grids towards where we areas where we found chimpanzee signs, but we know that savanna chimps use the savannas for traveling, almost, you know, and not really doing much else there. And we would try to include that as well. Um, we place camera traps in grassy areas as well as forested areas. Um, but of course, you know, it's it's very, very difficult to place cameras in the in the grassy areas because what do you attach that camera to? We, we need a tree or something. Um, so, I mean, we definitely have data on that that we have to investigate still. Um, but I would definitely think that a lot of um, we have bias towards forested areas for most of our sites, even when we were working in areas that were like savanna chimpanzees, savanna woodland chimpanzees. Um, yeah does that answer the question <laughs> yeah 100 percent. thank you as i say I'm like, I've, I've been well out of it for so long now <laughs> it's just really interesting to find out what's going on like now nowadays so yeah i work in a sort of different sector so it's just really interesting to sort of like reconnect with what's going on thank you <laughs> yeah so i mean we had we one of our field sites was the isa valley that's actually the site that's on chimpanzee now if you <laughs> want to go and refresh your memory <laughs> yeah um but certainly uh i mean I know that Alex helped us place a lot of cameras at areas where you see, this was, I remember, this was the other part of your question, where we see humans and chimpanzees using sort of the same areas. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I mean, it, it does definitely seem that when humans use an area, we see chimps using those areas less. There seems to be the divide. Um, but, you know, we really benefited from the long-term project being at that site and giving, you know, saying you should put a camera there or, or him having the camera and sharing that data with us. So, you know, when we go into sites where there isn't a long term conservation or research presence, then we probably are missing like really important things like that, that, you know, the field teams that have been there a long time have already found insights into. Mm. It's interesting. So um, when you're talking about habituated chimpanzees, I was assuming that you were talking about chimpanzees that are habituated to researchers, but sounds like that some might be habituated to entirely different behaviors from local humans do you do you see a big difference there or do they generally avoid the sort of the indigenous human population or so there is always these anecdotes from the Gualogo triangle for example where there is not a lot of human indigenous population that they when they for when cricket sands and dave morgan first went there that those chimpanzees didn't run away from them that they were curious um you know and so that those chimps are actually fairly easy to habituate but most areas that we work in there's poaching and so chimps know to go away if humans are approaching okay 
Uh, Milan, do you want to ask your question? Oh, can't hear it. Uh, so you're saying, did you observe any conflicts between species or groups, or are they better than humans? I mean, we know that <laughs> better than humans, that's cute. Um, we know that chimpanzees engage in intergroup conflict. So they patrol their territories and uh, they will make incursions into neighboring groups. They will attack and kill um, neighboring individuals. We don't really have that from our camera trap data from the Pan Am specifically, but almost at every site that's um, been observed that's been habituated and under study, we know that there's these intergroup killings. It's pretty common in chimpanzees. It's one of the things that sort of separate chimpanzees and bonobos. Um, for those that don't know bonobos, uh, they used to be called pygmy chimpanzees. They live exclusively south of the Congo River. And when two bonobo groups meet, tends to be just a lot of intercourse um, rather than any sort of killing or, um, or aggression. So it depends on what group of bonobos is being investigated, but in general, they have fairly peaceful intergroup encounters. So that's sort of one of the hallmarks of the species divide and the debate about are we more chimp or are we more bonobo? I read a paper somewhere uh, over the last year that was suggesting that it would, that bonobos had um, diverged in terms of their evolutionary behaviors because gorillas hadn't crossed the river. So that there weren't there weren't gorillas in bonobo territory. Yeah. Interesting. Sea territory, and uh, there's a lot more conflict. And then, of course, there's that um, study that came out of Luango about uh, that was uh, certainly in the news here about the um, chimpanzees killing baby gorillas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I haven't heard that gorilla theory. I mean, one of the main theories about bonobos is that the females um, were able to make their cycling cryptic, so males cannot dominate their reproduction. When they were able to make their cycling cryptic and uh, they were able to make coalitions between them, they were able to dominate the males. So they have um, very strong uh, female bonds and are, you know, their hierarchy has males and females mixed, whereas with chimpanzee, all males rank above all females. And so the idea of having these strong male female coalitions um, has led to a more peaceful society. I'm just going to say I like that theory more, William. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, you got your hand up. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. This is fascinating talk and I'm absolutely amazed at the scope of this of the whole project and uh, the number of contributors and the data which you are processing is up of unbelievable scale to an amateur like me. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for that talk. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a question. In your study of the pathogens, of the feces have you noticed any patterns happening in terms of pathogens and its spread amongst the populations and whether there's uh, uh, pathogens from humans going into those populations or coming the other way yeah so i have to say that that is not my big topic of expertise we have um, quite a few amazing collaborators that work on that so we have um fabian leonditz lab at the robert Koch institute in berlin um he's been doing most of the work on the pathogens i know in general in chimpanzees we see patterns like that like siv which is a precursor to hiv exists only in some chimpanzee subspecies not all of them um, zoonotic de disease transmission is a huge topic um, we know in mountain gorillas that respiratory diseases, um, the gorillas can get respiratory diseases from humans. Same in the um, chimpanzees and some of the long-term projects have gotten diseases from the human researchers or um, possibly from the poaching pressure from the hunters that exist in the forest. Um, so we certainly see human diseases going into wild animal populations. And we know, for example, that HIV also came from wild animal populations, most probably from the from bushmeat hunting, um, from the preparation of the meat for uh, bushmeat when there's you know, when the blood is present and then it can enter wounds and stuff like that. Um, in, in our particular case, I don't have uh, really, I mean, we've done studies on like herpes virus and sort of the evolution, but it exists in all of the populations, just 
you know, in various forms because mutations have accumulated and you can look at the population history of um, the, the, the various viruses. We, we share a lot of viruses between our species, but certainly in terms of zoonotic uh, transmission, I mean, that is an extremely hot topic. I guess we all have felt that pain recently. <laughs> Um, it's, it's a big problem for when humans and wildlife are coming into contact with one another is that we risk um, transmitting diseases to them and vice versa. You know, when I talk about orphan, being able to identify where orphans come from, a lot of people then jump to, oh, well, then we can, you know, reintroduce them into the wild. But a huge topic is, is that once they've been in contact with people, they can get every disease that a person has, colds, etc. And we don't want to just put them back into the wild and then infect wild populations with those diseases. So it's a very big topic for us. Mm. Interesting. Um, are there any more questions from anybody? If, if, if I may, I've just got one other thought. You, oh. You've talked about um, uh, using camera traps, ex, 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 extensive, uh, <laughs> lots of camera traps. Um, you haven't you haven't said anything about using things like radio collars to understand the cohesion or the you know dispersal of uh, of your various groups. Um, I'm going to just talk personally. I'm not going to talk for my whole project when I say this. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of radio collars because there are a certain number of animals that die when they are radio collared. Um, you know, the animal the collars can get trapped on things. Um, in general, also, when I can, I know that there's some, um, uh, they tried radio calling gorillas, for example, and a gorilla can rip off any radio collar that you put on them. So that has never been successful. When they have done some reintroduction studies, they've put radio collars on chimps, and I know of at least one that hung itself on that with that radio collar. So it's not like considered a great method for apes. The other thing too is, is that for some species, you can dart them and radio collar them and put them back in their group and sort of no one's the wiser. With chimps, if you darted, let's say an alpha male, that could cause a huge social disruption. You know, they would be without their alpha male for a while. Um, it's also very dangerous. If you dart them when they're in trees, they can fall and kill themselves. And, um, and they're, you know, they're, they're very cognitive, cognitively advanced and they're very social. So we're not, we don't, this is another reason why we only collect feces is we don't even dart them for medical treatment or to get samples from them. We don't remove them from their group. We really try to work non-invasively with them. Do you do much um, endocrine testing of fecal samples? Yeah, endocrine sampling is difficult um, when you have unhabituated animals. It's very common, oh, it's not very common, but it is done with habituated animals from urine. That's sort of the more, that's the, uh, like the main thing that is used for endocrine uh, studies is urine as far as I know. And you can get fresh samples when you are under your study animal and they might urinate on a leaf or something like that. Um, I know that there's some more limitations with fecal samples. The hormones can vary a lot during the day. Usually for endocrine studies, also you have to freeze the samples with the genetics. It can all be done sort of at ambient temperature. You can store them in ethanol and then on silica and ambient temperature and, um, and then do your analyses. With hormones, things need to be frozen, which means you need to have a liquid nitrogen tank, which usually means that you need to have some sort of infrastructure in place. So that usually means habituated um, uh, chimpanzee group. Well, are there any more questions before we wrap up? If not, well, th um, thank you very much, Mimi. It's always lovely to see you again and um, for your very entertaining and informative talk. And uh, you certainly seem to have kept the our own population of apes spellbound, as we've hardly had anybody uh, drop off since the start of the talk, which is quite unusual to keep uh, nearly everybody here till the end of the Q and A. So oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again very much, and. Um, Look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.